Good morning, everyone. You guys hear me okay? Great. Well, it's wonderful to be together again. It's my privilege and uh, pleasure to invite you to take out your copy of God's Word and turn to Luke chapter 8, if you would. Luke chapter 8, it's the next part of our series through the Gospel of Luke. So if you can find it, I'll give you a moment. Then if you, when you found it, just shout at me, got it, or something like that, and we'll work our way together. So... Luke chapter 8, I'm going to be reading from verses 4 through the end of verse 21. Okay. Got it? it? Excellent. All right. Someone's tracking with me. Okay. Here we go. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 to 21. This is God's holy and authoritative word. And when a great crowd was gathering and people from every town, town after town, came to him. He said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing They may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while And then in times of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, and puts it, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. <clears throat> Excuse me. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care, then, how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. And then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are outside, desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Let me pray for us. Father, we ask you now to come by your spirit and may these fine folks hear a better sermon than the one I'm about to preach by the miracle of your Holy Spirit speaking through your word. Do something in our hearts this morning, we pray. Do something in our lives by your grace for our good and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Uh, Three friends went hunting on a beautiful November afternoon. One was a doctor, one was a lawyer, and one was a pastor. And they were out in the woods and walking through the woods, and they caught a glimpse of a 12-point buck in the glade ahead of them. Simultaneously, all three men raised their rifles and fired at the buck. And sure enough, immediately it dropped to the ground dead. The three men, they ran over to it, they were looking at it, and they argued about whose shot was successful. 
They argued and they argued and they argued. Each man convinced that he owned the right to this buck. After a few minutes, a, a, a kind of park ranger or a game warden came by and they introduced themselves to him. They told him what had happened and they asked him to help them decide who the winner was. So the warden bent down and immediately stood back up and he said, oh, the preacher shot this buck. And the lawyer and the doctor said, what? The preacher? And the warden answered them, yeah, it was easy to tell. The bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> in one ear and out the other. That is a big common problem for all of us, I think. How many times in my life has Claire said to me, could you take the bin out? Could you take, or trash as you guys call it. Could you, <laughs> could you guys take out, could you take the bin out? Could you put the recycling out? And I sit there and I say, yeah, sure, leave it to me. I'll sort it, no worries. And then I immediately forget to do it. And then when she says, you didn't take the trash out, I say, when did you ask me to do that? I don't even have any recollection of the conversation. And it's taken me nearly 25 years to develop and perfect that skill of, of listening but not really hearing. And I get from the kind of the stifled laughs that many of you are in the same boat as me. So I don't feel so bad. But there is this vast difference between listening and hearing. And the distinction between listening and hearing can be a big problem in our relationships, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces, in society at large. But it's e there's even more at stake when God's word speaks to us. And today's, today's text speaks right into that issue. In verses 4 to 21, we have Luke put together three kind of vignettes. We have a parable in verses 4 to 15. We have this illustration of a lamp in verses 16 to 18, and then the visit of his family in verses 19 to 21, which all occurred during Jesus' ministry in Galilee. And Luke clusters these things together because he has a purpose, a particular purpose for the reader to get hold of. Now, a careful reading of these three separate vignettes indicates that they are woven together because the words hear, heard, and hearing feature nine times in those three vignettes. And so what we're going to learn this morning, the main point of my sermon this morning is this. True disciples of Jesus demonstrate their faith by properly hearing and responding to God's word with obedience. True disciples of Jesus demonstrate their faith by properly hearing and responding to God's word with obedience. And I've got four points this morning to unpack this, these three vignettes. We're going to hear about a story about hearing. We're going to see a lesson about hearing. We're going to be told the right way of hearing. And then we're going to see the blessings of hearing. So let's begin with the story of hearing. This is verses 4 through 8. <clears throat> Now, word about this carpenter turned miracle worker and healer and teacher is spreading like wildfire throughout town after town and village and city so that a great crowd, Luke tells us, people from all over were coming together. People from different backgrounds, different ages, different levels of understanding, different needs, different motivations for being there. They were all coming to check out what the fuss was with this Jesus fellow. And so Jesus then sits them down and begins to teach them. And he describes a familiar scene to that first audience. He tells them about a sower who has a bag slung over his uh, shoulder that's full of grain. And he walks up and down his field, throwing the seed on the ground, sowing the seed into the soils. And Jesus tells us some fell on the well-trodden path, but the birds of the air swooped down and gobbled it up. Some fell on the rocky ground. Now, when, when, when Luke and, and Jesus are speaking about rocky ground, it doesn't mean like if you go out into your backyard and you dig it up, there'll be a mixture of soil and rocks, and it's just kind of like, oh, it's a bit awkward. No, in Palestine, on the hills where they farmed, it would have been kind of a two inches of soil on a bedrock of limestone that was, you just couldn't penetrate. So that's kind of what he means when he talks rocky ground. 
And the seed that falls there sprouts quickly, but it withers in the Palestinian heat. Some fell on thorny ground, where the weeds and the thorns choked off the growth of the seedling. And then some fell on the good and fertile soil, and it produced a golden harvest, a bumper crop. And then Jesus delivers this punchline. He says, if you've got ears, make sure you hear. Now, for you and I who have heard this story since we were kids, perhaps, or we have Luke's gospel in our very hands this morning, it could be difficult to try and put ourselves into the shoes of those first audience because it's too familiar. But just try to imagine with me what it must have been like in that moment. So Jesus, seated on a hill, uh, some say maybe in a boat, uh, in Mark's parallel account but he's seated and he's teaching and he's surrounded by thousands of people and he tells this short farming story without any explanation and then does this mic drop boom if you've got ears make sure you can hear now I reckon if we were there there would have been a bunch of people in that crowd scratching their heads going did you did you come for an agricultural lesson what's he on about what did he say You know, what happened to the Jesus who taught so clearly in previous chapters about loving your enemies and about not judging others or being a hypocrite or about how the condition of one's heart determines the fruit in one's life? What about the, the Jesus who spoke about the importance of firm foundations? Even the disciples didn't have a Scooby Doo about what he was on about. In verse 9, they, they come to Jesus and knowing that it's not just farming best practices that Jesus is teaching, they say, tell us what it means. And so Jesus begins to answer. And he, he actually, if you read Mark's account again in Mark 4, he answers in private. This is not information for the whole crowd. This is for the disciples who are probably more than the 12 Includes the women that were referenced in verse 3 and everybody who kind of followed Jesus, the the 72 or the 120 perhaps. And Jesus' answer to the question, what does it mean, moves us from the story to the lesson of hearing, which is point number two. A lesson about hearing. After the Good Samaritan of Luke 10 and the Prodigal Son of Luke 15, this is probably the next most famous parable that Jesus tells. And it's, the, it's, it's a parable that's recorded in all three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not in John. And it's the first major parable in Luke. So some commentators describe it as the mother of all parables. And it's also the only parable in Luke that's given a detailed interpretation So some commentators call it a gateway parable because Jesus uses it to explain the purpose of the parables. Now perhaps you have heard it said, rightly so I think, parables are an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Anybody heard that? Okay, I don't think that's right. And perhaps you've heard it said that Jesus was a master storyteller and he used everyday characters and vocations and situations and actions to capture people's attention, to make his teaching accessible and memorable. And that sounds right too, doesn't it? Except that's not what Jesus says. Look at verse 10 with me. Jesus suggests something quite the opposite. Uh, Let me read it. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, he says to the disciples. But for others, they're in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now, if it looks like Jesus is quoting something there, and if you look in your footnotes or your cross-references, you will find that the words that Jesus speaks here come out of Isaiah chapter 6. Know that famous Old Testament chapter? Isaiah the prophet has this amazing vision of the heavenly throne room and he sees almighty God high and lifted up and the the majestic robes filling the temple and the angels are there singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory and everything is shaking and it's filled with smoke and everything's trembling in God's presence, including Isaiah. And then God comes and he cleanses him and he commissions him and he gives him this happy job description in verse 9 and 10 of Isaiah chapter 6. 
God says, go and say to the people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. In other words, God says to Isaiah, you need to go and preach to these people, but they're not going to listen and they're not going to obey. Good luck. Now, back to Luke 6 and Jesus' conversation with his disciples. He says, he references Isaiah chapter 6 because he's trying to make the point that parables are divinely designed by God to both reveal and conceal at the same time. They're designed to reveal and conceal the same sun that hardens the clay, melts the wax. And so the huge crowds that were coming out to see him, wanting to see a circus show of spectacular miracles and healings, Jesus has got no interest in amassing a great following. So he speaks in parables to sort out and to sift and to expose the true spiritual condition of the hearts of his hearers. Because he's on this lookout and he's seeking people with particular ears and particular hearts. True disciples who will demonstrate their faith by properly hearing and responding to his word with obedience. Now he tells the disciples that to them has been known, uh, made known the secrets of the kingdom. Now that doesn't mean oh, you've got some mysterious magical knowledge that no one else has got. But he says no, God has chosen to graciously reveal these gospel truths to you. Things that you would never come to understand in and of yourselves but he does that because you realize that hearing is more than just acknowledging sound waves. It's being sincere hearers rather than just mere casual learners. And it's a lesson that we need to learn too. Anytime you and I open up the scriptures, whenever we get out our Bibles, we are faced with the same choice as the first audience. Am I going to be a, an aloof spectator? Or am I going to let God's word affect me and change me and transform me? So how do we learn the lesson? Well, that takes us to our third point, the right way of hearing. Having explained the purpose of the parables, they are to reveal and conceal he now explains the specifics of this parable. He says in verse 11, the seed is the word of God and the soils represent different kinds of ways that we hear and respond to the word. The hard soil represents an indifferent heart, a heart that is hard, a heart that could be hard for so many different reasons. It could be because it's a heart that's uninterested or bored, apathetic, skeptical, that considers this just a huge waste of time. Or they think it's implausible and unbelievable. Or it's a heart that's unwilling to turn from sin. Or perhaps hostile even, bitter from life's cruel experience. And Jesus tells us that the, the heart like this is like the well-trodden path. The seed just kind of bounces off it. It doesn't penetrate the ground. It, it stays on the surface and then Satan, pictured as a bird, is able to swoop in and steal away the seed so that it makes no impression on the heart or the mind or the conscience of the listener. It's the in one ear and out the other. Satan hates it when we open our Bibles. Whether it's in reading, whether it's in personal devotions, whether it's in Bible study, whether it's in the sitting, under the preaching of his word, every open Bible is a battlefield for spiritual warfare. Because Satan is trying to stop us from truly hearing. And we need to be ready. And we need to be aware. Then there's the second soil. The shallow soil represents superficial hearts. These are People who perhaps respond enthusiastically and emotionally initially, but because we all know that life is not cupcakes and rainbows every single day, the storms of life strike. The persecutions that kind of ratchet up the cost of following Jesus come. And faith in these superficial, shallow hearts 
shrivels up and dies because it's not rooted. Billy Ocean used to sing, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's kind of what is happening here. Now, let me just be clear. We at this church, we do believe that if you are truly born again, you cannot be unborn again. We truly believe that if you are justified, you cannot be unjustified. The golden chain of salvation can never be broken. And yet, if we are honest with the scriptures, and we see this evidence of this throughout the New Testament, it, it, you have to say at the same time as that, that, that you can appear to have an external connection to Jesus, even for a while, and yet not follow him to the end. So there's a warning here. Perhaps we all know someone like this and our hearts break for them. Then there's the thorny soil, which represents the distracted heart. My 10-year-old son, Devon, and I have been planting a herb garden this year. So on our property that we're renting, there's some raised beds. We've dug them out. We sowed some seeds, we're growing some oregano, some basil, they're the correct ways to say those herbs. Um, <laughs> sage, mint, thyme. Uh, we're growing these herbs, and we, so we dug them out, we sowed these seeds. I have been absolutely amazed at how plentiful and how quickly the weeds grow. I, and I stand there and I think, I didn't plant weed seeds. Where did these thistles and briars come from? I have to get down on my hands and knees and weed. Because if you don't weed, the, the seeds are robbed of the light and the water and the nutrients of the soil. So effectively, they're choked off. And the life and the growth of the seeds is hindered and stopped. It's the same, Jesus says, of the distracted heart. The cares of life, the, the tyranny of just ordinary daily demands, the, the kind of the normal stuff of life, the emails and the texts and the tax return and the doctor's appointments and the kids' sports schedules and the home maintenance projects and the assignment deadlines and the weekly errands and the family commitments and reconciling your bank account and a thousand other things can distract us. And then there's the riches and the pleasures of life, the desire for a new car, thinking about vacation, the gym time, the, the house remodeling, the comforts that help us to kick back and relax, the, the endless opportunities for entertainment, the incessant buzz of social media, and the glare of our phone screens. All of these things, not necessarily bad in and of themselves, but they preoccupy us and they overwhelm us and they distract us and they get in the way and they crowd out. The spiritual life and growth that we want and need. To draw on John, John Bunyan's old allegorical story, there are many would-be pilgrims who set out and search for the celestial city only to end up getting stuck and snared by Vanity Fair. But there is hope. There's a fourth soil, Jesus says. The good soil represents the receptive heart. The seed here lands in the soft, open, good, receptive, fertile soil and it penetrates and sinks down deeply. It germinates, it grows, it flourishes and it bears fruit and it produces this bumper crop. When he talks about a hundred times, you've got to think about that. One seed, a hundred things. Wow, you're supposed to go, wow, really? It accomplishes, yes, more than you can ask or imagine. Jesus' point is the heart of the true and the sincere hearer who hold fast to the word. That means they receive it, they believe it, they cling to it, they persevere in it. They're, they're faithful and obedient to do what it says. They're the ones that produce an abundant fruit. So that true disciples demonstrate their faith by properly hearing and responding to God's word in obedience. And these three vignettes, this, this parable in particular, that it's a window for us to see the truth. And it's a mirror that is held up for us to see ourselves. You see, every single one of us here in this room is in this parable somewhere. 
And the parable forces us to, to ask the question of ourselves, what kind of soil am I? Am I an in one ear and out the other? The superficial hearer without root? Or the weed-infested, distracted heart? And it calls us, it calls us to be people, men and women and boys and girls who instead strive to be humble and receptive and faith-filled and faithful and patient and persevering, obedient disciples of Jesus. The secret of the kingdom of God in this parable is not anything to do with the sower or the seed. Everything, everything in this parable hangs on the receptivity of the soil. Now you might be sat there and you say, everything? Are we talking about salvation or are we talking about fruitfulness as a disciple? And I'm going to say, yes. All right. Scripture often works on multiple levels all at the same time. Some alternating back and, back and forth between the two. Some side by side. Some all mixed together. So for example, the first concern is, is this about salvation? Is it about how one gets into the kingdom of God? Yes. But is it also about how one is a fruitful member of the kingdom of God? Yes. The parable addresses the first one, certainly, but... The emphasis on hearing and doing, I think, that are throughout these three vignettes, I think indicate that the, the, the second concern, being a fruitful member of the kingdom, is the dominant one. And to hammer home the point, Luke gives us a second vignette in verses 16 to 18, an illustration about a lamp. Verse 16, Jesus says, if you've got a lamp, you use it. You allow it to do what it's designed to do. To shine light. Now Jesus changes the imagery somewhat, but it's clear from the context that the seed and the lamp are the same thing. They refer to the word of God. And then in verses 17 and 18, Jesus kind of issues this powerful summarizing statement and command. Nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest. Nor is anything secret that will not be made known and come to light. Take care then how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. Now if Jesus was here, he'd say, hang on a sec, right, listen. This isn't really about farming. This isn't really about agriculture. This isn't really about interior design. This is about God's word. And everyone... Everyone will be held accountable for how we receive God's word, how we respond to the light. Will we let it shine into the darkness of our lives? Will we use it or will we ignore it? Jesus says, take care how you hear. It re-speaks and restates the question that we asked earlier, are we listening or are we hearing? Are we using and applying what God gives to us in his word? Are we walking in the light of his word? Everything hangs on the receptivity of the soil. And here, everything hangs on how you receive and respond to the light of God's word. So Jesus says, to the one who does, increase fruitfulness, abundance, grace, just like the fourth soil. But to the one who doesn't, to refuse the light is to continue to walk in the darkness, and that's tragic. It's just like soils one, two, and three. Even what you thought you had will be gone, will wither, will be choked off. You'll be left with nothing. Everything hangs on how you receive and respond to the light of God's word. And then just in case, we still have blocked ears. Luke calls for backup with a third vignette. Verses 19 and 20, Jesus' family arrive. They want to see him, but the crowd means that they can't get close to him. So they get a message to him saying, listen, your mom and your brothers are outside. They want to see you. And Jesus, without you know, dismissing his family, without disrespecting his family, without dishonoring his family, he says, hang on a sec. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God, and do it. Jesus 
He says, my true family is not people who are, it's not defined by human ancestry, it's not defined by bloodlines, it's not defined by DNA. My true family, true disciples, are people whose faith works itself out in obedience. Now listen, Jesus is not saying that the way you get into my family is because of your obedience. That would be wrong. The gospel tells us that it is only through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus that we are saved, that we can be forgiven, that we can be born again to a living hope, that we can be brought into right relationship with God, that we're united to Christ and joined to him. Membership of the family of God is open to everyone who will repent and believe and put their hope in Jesus and call on his name for salvation. And if you are here this morning and you wouldn't consider yourself to be a Christian, if you've not staked everything that you have on the name of Jesus, then his invitation is open to you this morning. The Bible would tell you that you are a sinner who has committed cosmic treason against the Most High God. And because of that, you are under his wrath for all eternity. And you can't escape it yourself. But you can through one who came into the brokenness of our world and died on a cross in your place to bear the penalty for your sins in full and who died and who rose again and in his resurrection offers you a share in his life if you will believe in him and trust in him. If that's you this morning, come and talk to me afterwards. Talk to Jared, someone you saw on the stage. Someone at the Welcome Center, the person who brought you. You can go home being the fourth soil this morning. And if you're here this morning and you are by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone saved, then Jesus would say to you, the distinguishing mark and the unmistakable family feature is obedience to God's word. If God's word calls you to forgive someone because they've sinned against you, then do it. If God's word calls you to confess your sin, then do it. If you are to seek forgiveness because you've sinned against someone else, then go and do it. If God's word impresses upon you the need to put to death sin and put on righteousness, then go do it. If it's to give generously, then do it. If it's to serve in a new way, then do it. If it's to go and share the gospel with someone, then do it. If it's to pursue purity and holiness, then do it. These three vignettes tell us that whatever it is and whenever it is that you hear the word of God, it's not proper hearing until you respond in obedience. J.C. Ryle, the Bishop of Liverpool from the 1800s said this, the gospel which we possess was not given us only to be admired and talked of and professed but to be practiced. It was not meant to reside in our intellects and our memories and on our tongues, but to be seen in our lives. You know, usually we hear a sermon and we evaluate it. If you're anything like our our family, you know, the ride home in the car and lunch is like, hey, what did you think this morning? He had four points. I don't like sermons with four points. I'm a solid three-point sermon. And he says Isaiah in a really funny way. And I didn't like his joke at the beginning. I don't think we should be telling jokes like that. And I blame Jim because I learned that from the bridge. All right. And what's going on with his shirt and his shoes? You know, and there's all of those kind of conversations. All right. But actually what Jesus says to us here in these three vignettes is this. When you hear a sermon, you should evaluate yourself. We must evaluate ourselves. Let's be people who take care how we hear. Let the word of God sink deeply down into our hearts and into our souls and cause fruit to be born in our lives. Let's be people who hear in the right way. Maybe there are some of us here this morning who... Honestly, if we conducted a soil test or a hearing test, the results may not come back favorably. 
Well, I've got good news for you this morning. God is in the business of plowing up hard hearts. He is in the business of breaking up the rocky ground. He is in the business of pulling out the stubborn weeds. All we need to do is turn to him and ask him to make us that kind of good soil. It's a prayer he loves to answer. Let's ask him to plant the word deep into our hearts. Let's ask him to make that most difficult jump of 18 inches between our ears and our hearts by the power of his spirit so that we can bring forth fruit in our lives. Let's pray that together. Now, this is one of the most, I think, heart-searching and conscience-pricking parables that Jesus tells. And so lest we leave here wrongly weighed down by some kind of sense of legalistic duty to respond. Let's finish with the fourth point, the blessings of hearing. As we seek to hear and hold fast to the word of God in verse 15, as we seek to take care how we hear in verse 18, as we hear the word and obey in verse 21, God promises delightfully, graciously, with grace-filled promises to meet us. And bless us. Look at verse 15. He says this. <coughs> excuse me. As for those in the good soil, those who hear the word, hold fast to it in an honest and a good heart, they will bear fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, humility, gratitude, thankfulness, generosity, servanthood, godliness, zeal. Hope, perseverance, they can be ours in a hundredfold. Verse 18, take care how you hear. For the one who has, more will be given. There's a promise of more here. More of Jesus, more fruit, more of our experience of him being richer and thicker and deeper. More assurance of our hope and our salvation. More of God in our lives so that, that as, as Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 3, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. In verse 21, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. As we continually look up and look upon God's word and and behold God's glory in Christ through the written word, as we hear and respond to what he calls us to, we will increasingly bear the glorious family resemblance of God. We'll become more like our older brother Jesus and more like our heavenly father. And we'll reflect his glory to a watching world. So that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of God will be transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. This is the power of the Holy Spirit at work for the glory of God. That's the blessings of hearing. Who doesn't want that? Fruit, life, Joy, Jesus, more and more and more every day until we see him face to face. Oh, brothers and sisters, let's live for that. True and fruitful disciples of Jesus demonstrate their faith by properly hearing and responding to God's word with obedience. Let me pray. Oh, great God of highest heaven, occupy our lowly hearts. Own it all and reign supreme and conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain that resists your holy war. For you have loved and you have purchased us. Make us yours forevermore. We were blinded by our sin and we had no ears to hear your voice We did not know your love within and we had no taste for heaven's joys. But then your spirit gave us life and it opened up your word to us. And through the gospel of your son, you have given us endless hope and peace. So help us now to live lives dependent on your grace. Keep our hearts, guard our souls from the evils that we face. You are worthy to be praised with our every thought and deed. O great God of highest heaven,
glorify your name through us. Amen.